This is the second of two books. Uh, the first was a history entitled, uh, what was it? Best of Intentions, uh, America's Campaign Against Strategic Weapons Corporation. Uh, I wrote that uh, because I was teaching and I didn't have materials to work with it. And I thought, well, look, every other major field, particularly policy, uh, you know, has a uh, critical history of some sort. You know, policy studies in economics, foreign affairs, military science. They, they all have histories that evaluate and assess various policies, how well they perform. I really could not find anything like that, at least not uh, 17 years ago. And uh, so I thought, look, if this is a serious field, we've got to do this somehow. I immediately ran into a problem, and that is, how do you write about uh, history, or how do you write a history uh, and, and, and uh, uh, identify and explain uh, what uh, occurred when the key feature of success is making sure certain things don't happen. So you're writing a history about things that didn't happen. <laughs> it's mildly difficult, if not you know, impossible. I mean, I think history is tough enough trying to explain things that have happened. I mean, it almost everybody gets into deconstructing history. So deconstructing the history of things that didn't happen, I just thought, wow, I can see why no one did this. <laughs> um, so I took a different approach. Instead of trying to focus first on chronology, uh, I thought what we should do is examine each of the premises of each nonproliferation effort that we've heard about that mattered. Uh, what were they trying to mitigate? Uh, and essentially what you discover is each initiative that, that's significant had a vision of the next war. Yeah? And you look at these visions, and after you look at them, you, you quickly come to the conclusion that if you get the problem wrong, the solution actually may not help very much. You, you can actually make your real problems worse. Now, I'll give you uh, an example here. Uh, my favorite, of course, is Adams for Peace, which is the history I first wrote in graduate school that kind of dragged me into what I'm doing now, or have been doing for a long time. Uh, this is an amazing uh, program, and the history is fascinating. Uh, essentially, the problem that Eisenhower and his assistants were worried about in the next war that they wanted to prevent was a kind of version of World War II with nuclear weapons. And by that I mean they thought that the key target set would be the military industrial mobilization base. Roughly, America's the largest 100 cities. And what they argued, and you can see this, it wasn't just them, it was their predecessors. You can see the National Security Memorandum 68. They said, well, how many weapons would the Russians need to knock out 100 American cities? Well, initially it was a simple number. Uh, you took uh, 100 and you multiplied it times 2 because you figured some of them wouldn't get there. Or, you know, maybe someone would shoot the bomber down, uh, or they'd miss the target, or whatever. Uh, but then someone came up with the idea of air defense. And so the, the number became somewhat elastic. Uh, they did a study, Oppenheimer did, right before the Eisenhower administration, and said what you needed to knock out the United States now, maybe four, five 500, 600 weapons. But as we install air defense, it might expand upward to maybe 15,000. Well, a little squishy, you know, for quantitative analysis, but a start, you know. The problem uh, is that to knock out, you know, those hundred cities, it was going to take a lot of weapons. And so what they did is they said, well, they need, we need to worry about what they call the knockout stockpile, knockout blow stockpile. Uh, it was kind of an interesting concept. The problem was, at the same time, the Rand Corporation was doing studies saying, you know, 100 cities is not the first target set. It's like the 15 strategic air command bases. And what you need to knock those out isn't such a large number, particularly the way you've got your airplanes lined up, wingtip to wingtip, 
like we didn't learn anything from World War II and Clark Airfield out in the um, Philippines, you know, which is, they all knocked them out because their airplanes were all, B-17s were all stuck together. Uh, in any case, uh, they also, uh, the folks at RAND, started to ruminate, and other people in the arms control, about what was called catalytic war. This, so they started to think about this a little later after the Suez crisis. And it turned out that for these people worried about that threat, one weapon would be a problem, just one. Never mind, the Adams for Peace program focused on many hundreds of bombs. And as a result, the known holes in the proposed safeguard system to make sure that civil material wouldn't get diverted into military material was known and kind of embraced saying, well, it doesn't matter. They have to only detect the diversion of scores of bombs. Actually, uh, Stassen argued, you know, if someone diverted 50 uh, bombs of 50 megatons, uh, it wouldn't matter. You need more to knock us out. And so a lot of very good suggestions by uh, Ambassador Wadsworth uh, to really make the IA a tough organization with tight fizzle controls were put aside. We don't need them. The Indians and the Russians don't like them. We want to get to yes. You don't need them anyway. And so that was put aside. Not only that, but the whole idea behind Adams for Peace was to promote civil nuclear programs to draw down the fizzle in the Soviet stockpile uh, by forcing them to compete with us selling reactors and fuel so they'd never get to this knockout blow stockpile level. I mean, it was sophisticated, but it was really kooky. <laughs> and it was wrong. Uh, I would argue the Adams for Peace program, not a real big success story if you're really hard-headed about non-proliferation. Okay, then you get a taste of it. Um, now, the second book is not about history. It's about the future. I kept teaching, and I noticed another gap in the, in the literature that my students were you know, complaining about. You really didn't have a lot of writing about future trends that went very far. I tend to read stuff about the crisis du jour. You know, hey, Ron, what's happening? What should we do now? North Korea, what's happening? What should we do now? Pakistan, India, what's happening? What should we do now? Okay, fine. But if you wanted to uh, think about major trends, and project into the distant future like folks do in military science, economics, and dare I say it, even political science. Not so much available. Now, I think if, again, you want to be a serious field, you've got to have at least a bad book on that. <laughs> and, and we didn't even have a bad book. <laughs> so, so my contribution is we, you know, I got the ball. <laughs> uh, now, I guess uh, I tried to take this on. Uh, I told somebody I would do this. By the way, when you apply for grants, be very careful about what you promise. <laughs> Some of them notice, and they hold you to it. Uh, so eventually I got it done. By the way, it's, it started with a promise. I'm a little embarrassed to say, uh, roughly, 10, 15 years ago. Well, I had to do a lot of research. You know, a lot of this work hadn't been done yet. In fact, it was going to be much bigger work. And then I said, well, I already wrote that stuff. Why would I want to put it all together? So I distilled it. I saved you the aggravation of having to read all the stuff that went into this. In any case, I started by trying to paint as grim a picture as possible. By the way, if you want to know uh, what my prejudice is, I always say, roughly, make it look as horrible as possible so that people will say, that's unacceptable, maybe we should do something about that. Try not to get too carried away. Don't go for the extreme cases. But make a modest argument about how that makes it uh, If that doesn't get a rise out of people, you then realize you're in much deeper trouble than you think. And, and that's useful to know. 
that's useful enough. So I, I stay away from extreme uh, threat monitoring, but I like uh, moderate threat monitoring. So somewhere, try to be resistant. So what I did is I wrote a, a, a kind of a big piece for a book called The Last Arms Race, or The Next Arms Race, The Next Arms Race, the last one I don't know about. Um, I tried to look at trends over the last half century. And I'll just talk about two. There are many others that are discussed in the book. But the two were kind of, i just give you a flavor. Um, if you go back to about 62, which is a good time to go back to, because things were rather intense then. Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, things like that occurred around then. It was, it was an intense period in Cold War. And also 50 years, uh, you know, because we're on the decimal system, 50 years. We like 50 years and 100 years, 75 years. So 50 years. Uh, if you go back then, you find that the U.S. was extremely dominant. Maybe I have a chart here. Let's see. Oh, by the way, my wife did that cover. Does anybody, does anybody know what that's a picture of? Yes, a nuclear blast crater. Okay, you get half credit. Who gets full credit? The Trinity thing? Trinity, first one, right? No. By the way, you said this is unforgivable. I <laughs> think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, by the way, if you're really clever, you'll open up the cover and look on the inside. Oh, it's, it's it'll tell you. Is it perfect? Yes. So that was his. He gets credit. He gets credit. Well, well, only because we inferred that from your response to Perez. Yes. <laughs> it must be Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, that was a peaceful nuclear explosive, the first one. Okay. And you can see the, the size of the crater. Also, the My wife is bad. She's over there. If you need any covers, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. If you take a look over the last 50 years, what you see is a compression. It's kind of interesting. A multiplication and compression. Where the United States had 24,000, now, you know, roughly it has about 2,000. Uh, I mean, you can, you can talk about things in reserve, I suppose, but... But we'll stick with things that are nominally deployed. Uh, I gave Russia credit for deploying a bit more than they take credit for, you know, <laughs> because they don't like talking about tactical weapons. But but I give them credit for that. And so you can cut this a lot of different ways. The orders of magnitude don't change though. But even if you include everything you want to, it, it, it's still what's interesting is you end up concluding that from the if you get rid of France in this case because it only had two. And North Korea, because it has, I don't know what, you know, maybe it's got 10 or less. You get rid of those outliers, you still have a movement from uh, a difference from the top uh, number of, you know, the country that has the most to the country that has the least. And the first case is uh, about th more than three orders of magnitude difference. I mean, the Russians, uh, well, the British had about 50 and we had 24,000. In, in this case, in 2014, the difference uh, is about 100, let's say, for, I don't know, India or Pakistan, roughly. I mean, I don't know, things can share. You know, you, 2014, we can argue nibble around the size of roughly that. And, you know, Russia had maybe 3,600. And so you're now shucking off two orders of magnitude difference between the high and the I think that's interesting, and I don't think people think enough about what that might mean. Um, by the way, a lot of folks talk about qualities. I studied under Albert Wolstetter, and surely they matter. But I like to refer to Stalin, who says, quantity has a quality all of its own. And as we learn how to deliver these things and move them around, the difference between a very sophisticated force and an unsophisticated one is also not as great as it used to be. Uh, also, politicians are seized with numbers. So it doesn't matter what the qualities are for them they respond to someone having more, whether they should or should. Okay, the other trend that, that I think was interesting uh, had to do with how in the early 60s, 62, there really was no surplus fissile material hanging around. It all got immediately turned into weapons material for the most part. Now, there wasn't a stockpile of reserve material that we drew on. It was put out in the field immediately. 
Uh, there was a little bit of stuff done with civilian, but not much. Uh, whereas today, and I refer you to Frank von Hippel's excellent works, uh, whoops, you have these bizarre charts, of enormous overhangs, <clears throat> where uh, you know India has maybe 500 weapons worth of uh, you know reactor grade or whatever uh, plutonium, China has fissile material for at least something on the order of a thousand more weapons if it wants. Uh, Japan has enough material maybe to make 1,500 weapons. Okay, yeah, and everyone can say, oh, but it's reactor grade. Uh, I, I have to advise you, having talked with people who know something about that, though, it's a mistake to emphasize that very much. It really is. And industry loves emphasizing it. I think diplomats do, uh, but they don't make bombs. The uh, more important point is that the Russia and the United States have tens of thousands of bombs worth of surplus material that they could conceivably be militarized. That's different. It means that folks can ramp up or break out in a way they couldn't a half century. And it's probably going to get more interesting into the future. The amount of reprocessing and enrichment surplus capacity and the number of places where that might occur uh, is going to go up. I mean, at, at the very least, we've got to start watching uh, Japan, South Korea, and China uh, in this regard, uh, but other places perhaps as well. Uh, perhaps if we're not lucky, uh, the Middle East. In any case, that's different. So anyway, I'm real proud of you know how grim. I mean, you can watch. Oh, I suppose uh, just to rub in how grim. You always need graphics. Okay, 62, the world uh, on nuclear weapons, uh, roughly something like this. Right? France <laughs> probably didn't have anything because it was ex exploded everything it had in that test. UK had 50, Russia had, as I said, uh, approximately 2,500. Uh, excuse me, 2,500. We had about 24,000. Uh, this is the world uh, today, roughly, in the last decade. By the way, this is, way, this is the American preferred vision of the world. North Korea is on there because we're going to talk them out of whatever they have. Uh, UK and France is uh, just basically things European. They're, they're all kind of glommed together uh, because, well, they coordinate a little bit. Maybe we talk to them about what they should shoot at because uh, they're NATO allies. But you notice everybody's a NATO ally or a non-NATO ally or a strategic partner or a I don't know what that is, strategic statement. By the way, Russia used to be a strategic party, but I had to erase that. I guess that's not the case for the moment. The point is, everything revolves around us. By the way, I kind of like this. I don't know if it's true. It doesn't sound right, but, but that's how we would like to see the world. Uh, and those are the numbers. You can sort of manage that, because all the other relations don't matter. Only we matter, and we relate to these folks. However, I think... Uh, where we might be heading, according to my view, is something like this. Where countries are maybe, you know, three years away from whatever it is they might need to get a bomb or some bombs. I did this about 20 years ago. And I, you know, I suppose you could change some of the names, but it's, it's still pretty good. And it gives a general idea. You know, that this is the world of proliferation if you're not lucky. So I'm just curious, Henry, if I understood what you just said. Uh, because if you get what you said, I think it's telling. So this chart you actually prepared 20 years ago? Yeah, roughly. Okay, so you were making the same forecast 20 years ago. Hey, you know, okay. if people listen, it'll never happen. Okay. It's called a warning. <laughs> it's not a prediction. <laughs> I mean, by the way, people who are academic always get uh, fascinated with how right people are about their warnings, and, and they confuse warnings with predictions. Uh, John Kennedy takes it on the head all the time, and it's just not fair. It was a warning. <laughs> it was not simply a prediction. He said, if you don't do certain things, then something will happen. Yeah. So I'm not, I know, now look, I'm not John Kennedy. I mean, I got that. But I think if you're in the policy world, you have to talk about how bad things will get. And if you're really good at what you do, you're wrong all the time. 
it's different than the academic world where you have to be right all the time. <laughs> Although one might argue that these prognoses with respect to forecasting proliferation have uh, very routinely uh, been false. Right, how should I put it? Aren't we successful? Well, I'll take credit, but not for the way you do. <laughs> All right. Anyway, something to think of. You put it strong in your head, but you know, someone's got to do it. All right. Now, I had a bit of a following when I put this thing out. A few people said, oh, wow, this is really clever. By the way, there's another chart uh, I put up which really drives people free. What the heck's that? Yeah, that one. Uh, this was considered, you know, like a breakthrough idea about uh, how long ago was it? I guess it must have been six years ago. Two thousand, yeah, it was like two thousand and nine. And the idea is, well, as we come down, will others come up? And do we care? And uh, we'll come back. Anyway, people, I think. There was a little bit of following, but not much. I know Rumsfeld uh, was somewhat seized with the idea. And I know he used to be on a board that gave money to me. And I once was at a gathering and asked the question, and he said, who are you? And I told him my name. He said, oh, I know who you are. There were like 200 people there. He says, I've read everything you've read. I, I felt like sitting down. I didn't want to ask a question. What's your favorite? I, well, I, I didn't, I, first of all, I don't even remember what I've written. Much less, you know, I guess I've read it because I wrote it. But you know, it, it was a lot of stuff. So he, I said something in one of these articles about a sprint to equality, and next thing I know, he's talking about a sprint to parity. I can't prove that he read it, but he used some of the same arguments. However, for the most part. I would have to say uh, I was disappointed in the reception. And the reason why is I thought, well, everybody's interested in going to zero. And, you know, shouldn't a, a book about or an article about the problem of the spread of nuclear weapons, which was not talked enough about with regard to going to zero, be kind of interesting to people? I think the short answer is not so much. And so uh, I kind of did what I was so good at before. I, I decided to put my work on the book aside. <laughs> it was 15 years already, I and mean, what's another? You know? So I, I said, well, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this isn't so clever. Uh, then I got a phone call uh, from uh, the assistant to John Mearsham at my alma mater, University of Chicago, and they asked me to give a talk uh, on uh, what I thought was interesting. So since I was trying to figure out why I wasn't very interesting, I thought I'd give a talk on what everybody else thought about uh, proliferation and nuclear weapons in hopes that I might, if I understood others better, would understand why they didn't think I was very interesting. So I kind of looked at all the literature that I had thought I had read and mastered, and I reread it, and then I read newer stuff, and I got one takeaway, which I didn't expect. Uh, and it was, it didn't really matter which school you kind of focused on. The arms control official view that uh, we should oppose, be opposed to nuclear weapons and try as much as we can to oppose proliferation and try to get to zero as soon as we can. Or the hawkish supporters of nuclear weapons who say, well, you want to hold on to these things, maybe you want to improve them. Uh, or what I call the radical academic skeptics, and I guess people call them uh, neorealists and new real neorealists. <laughs> so I just said radical academic skeptics. I think the problem with realism is it's loaded. It makes you sound like you're right and everyone's else is wrong. So I, I, I think that's unfair rhetorically. And, and these people believe that uh, nuclear proliferation is either good or it doesn't really matter because deterrence either is is absolutely automatic, or it doesn't work at all. Yeah? It doesn't matter which of these schools you read, all of them, all of them, are pretty optimistic in one respect, and that is they pretty much will tell you, we'll be okay if you just follow my advice. <laughs> I think 
be something unhinged. <laughs> well, this is a big problem, right? I mean, what do we really know about all of this stuff? I mean, we've got so few data points. You know, everyone does regression analysis of political science. How many, how many data points are they put in these models? It's absurd. I mean, it's, it's a handful. And then they say, well, therefore, they have to do this for various reasons, but it doesn't mean it's sound analysis. Uh, in any case, I, I kind of thought that didn't chime in correctly. So I, I kind of looked at these schools, and my impression is each of them has something that's genuinely sound. And each of them has something genuinely worse. You do not win by figuring out which is the correct school. And you don't square the difference between the schools. I'm going to end up telling you something that you would say, well, yeah, but that's common sense. You, you kind of move beyond the schools. And I'll, I'll walk you through this. By the way, I am not claiming originality. And it is. The first school is the school that says, you know, we ought to go down to zero. Uh, it's sort of the official view of a lot of governments, including our own. Uh, arms control view. Like this. By the way, I want you to understand about this top policy. Uh, someone called me and was very upset. Well, you put me in the wrong group. <laughs> and I said, that's okay. We're not even close friends, but I don't want to upset you. I'll take you out of the book. <laughs> no problem. Uh, a good topology doesn't get things right so much as it gets a good debate going that's useful. I'm going to claim I, I succeed. You might not agree. But please don't assume that these categories are for real. There are people who don't quite fit in any of these. However, you got to start somewhere, and you, it, this is not a bad way to go. I, I have people from respected schools uh, with respected names, and you can look at them, saying that they thought it was useful. So I'm going to hide behind them. In any case, the first school, I think, gets one thing right. Uh, actually, two things. And it's profoundly right. You know, everyone badmouths is zero on the right. You know, how silly. But if you get leaders in a room that have nuclear weapons, and you ask them, look, we're not going to let you out of this room until you agree on one number, I bet you the only number they'd ever agree on. Zero. <laughs> right? You know, they, everyone has to go down to zero. Now, how they get there, or whether they get there, that's a separate matter. But it's a really powerful argument. And I think people who, who, who look down their nose at that are foolish. They may know lots of practical things, but they don't know the value of the principle. How, how man, men, men and women, men, humankind work. You've got to have a goal. So they got that, I think, profoundly right. I think it's very powerful. Also, I think they, you know, they do a pretty good job of explaining well how much better the world would be if you could get this done. By the way, I would always include: Can we please get rid of digital displays while we're at it? Um, somehow, it doesn't have the same appeal. People get very upset when I bring that up. But I would maybe we can kind of push the barriers on that. But certainly, nuclear energy, I suppose, at some level, if you could get rid of it. Um, maybe on balance that would be a good thing. Uh, good luck getting there, but, but it's a good thing to think about. Also, I think they do a good job of how could you stay at zero. Now, there's a lot of interesting research as a thought exercise. It's very helpful. However, I think talking about the risks of the transitions to zero um, and the, the dangers, I don't think it's quite as honest or as clear as it needs to be. Uh, this, you know, as you come down, will others come up? Will that matter? Will people misread one one another? I think that actually, whatever you think about nuclear deterrence and its, you know, its real uh, parameters, uh, it's a real open question, a political science question, to how that works. They don't treat that, I think, very seriously. That transition. Also, I think when they talk about deterrence, it's really quite funny. Uh, I once asked a student, well, he wasn't a student, he's actually someone quite famous now uh, who teaches. Uh, I said, what are you working on? I said, well, I'm trying to explain why nuclear weapons uh, are worthless. I said, oh, that's great. How do you do that? And he said, well, you know, they're really only good for deterring. <laughs> and my rejoinder is, I think that sounds like an argument for everyone to get them. 
if that's all they do, you would want them. Of course, it gets crazier as you start figuring out uh, whether or not you have them or they'll be knocked out. You then have to worry about defending them, and then you have to worry about people attacking, and then you have to be worried about whether you're going to use them. And the next thing you know, you're preparing target lists. So deterrence is a slippery slide towards use. You think about it long enough. By the way, don't take my word for it. There are people who are respected, like uh, Quinlan, who make this point. Kind of interesting. We certainly have bona fides as people who are not maniacs. All right, anyway, uh, not only that, but when you press them on this point, I find there's on a, almost an automatic shift to a different topic. Yes, but what about accidents or terrorism? Now, that one's kind of hard to blow off. Because, gosh, you know, that could happen. We've come close. I don't know about the terrorism part, by the way, but accidents. Uh, Eric Slosser could not come here tonight. I think he wanted to be here. Uh, I've become friendly with him. It's a really remarkable book. Really remarkable book. He's put all of the people in this room and in every other room in the world that thinks they're experts on nuclear weapons to shame. That bibliography in the back of that book is unbelievable. I, I didn't even know about many of those things until I read the book. The man is a reader. He's, he's a troublemaker. And he reads. In any case, I recommend it. Uh, the accident matter is fine, I suppose, but I think one thing, it, it underestimates the other danger that countries might consciously want to use these things. And I think that you got to get back to that. It, it, that is a real problem, at least as immediate as some of the accidental issues. I think, in addition, the terrorism part, you know, the president somehow was advised to say it's the most immediate and extreme threat that one can imagine. And actually, I don't know how many of you people know the great Thielman is at the Arms Control Association, but he pointed out uh, at one of my gatherings, you know, an exchange between nations could be much worse than losing a city. Uh, and that may be more immediate or more likely in some cases than the possibility of someone with a ski mask running off with this stuff and torching Peoria. I think that's certainly my impression. I served on uh, a commission that allowed us to have all sorts of clearances, and the commission wanted to say nuclear terrorism was the number one threat until we went to various places in the intelligence community and asked them, uh, do you have any um, specific intelligence, they call it. It's, it's intelligence that's actionable about any nuclear terrorism threats. And the answers we got was no. Well, I mean, there was a lot of bro browbeating by the chairman. Well, I, you haven't looked hard enough. They were spending, I don't know, 10% of their intelligence budget looking, which seemed like a lot to me. And even though he did a lot of browbeating, um, they got the same answer. And I thought that what that then meant was that it may not be good. And I think we took the course on the commission to focus on biological threats as a result, because they at least, we had anthrax letter bombs. You know, this was something that happened. But of course, it wasn't quite as sexy because the number of people involved wasn't very large. I don't think that commission effort, in all fairness, is as memorable as it might have been <laughs> because of the way it went from the start focusing on that threat. So there's a problem. Now, when you get to the second school, uh, they're for it. Uh, and they make an argument that I think actually historically sounds more than plausible, that somehow these things have kept the peace or deterred aggression. Um, well, you know, I mean, it's just, you, know, you gotta think that maybe that's right. I mean, it's very hard to prove that. It's kind of like that non-proliferation problem. I mean, how do you prove what caused something not to happen? I mean, it's not so easy. There are other arguments uh, that can be made for why things didn't happen. Uh, it's open to speculation. Uh, also, I think um, this group tends to uh, over-argue, or have unbounded arguments 
you know, in their effort to show that you don't want to have certain transitions of coming down if others are coming up, which may be a good point. I think it may be. They need to pay more attention to give them credit. They then argue that, you know, nuclear weapons in the past have deterred. Uh, by the way, we have more than that. Uh, and it gives you the impression that, well, if more weapons help keep the peace in the past, wouldn't more weapons deter more? And wouldn't better nuclear weapons deter better? And oh, why, by the way, while we're at it, if it's good for us, wouldn't it be good if our friends had it? You know, Israel. I don't know. Uh, uh, by the way, if you go into certain places in our government, They'll whisper other names. I'm afraid I, I, I won't say the names. Well, you'll be astonished how even officials have friendly ideas about proliferation uh, to certain countries. Uh, but, uh, you know, Great Britain, that was okay. France, okay. And of course, the Russians had a view was what was okay. Why not more? At this point, you should be a little nervous. Also, I think they downplay the accident problem. I mean, it's one thing to say it. It's not the most immediate or urgent threat of the accidents. It's another thing to say, well, we've done a good job so far not to worry. You know, like, you know, it's going to be okay forever. That doesn't sound right either. I mean, it sounds like a dead against the house, is what I would think. You know, so we, that sounds a little too extreme. Now we talk about the neo realists, uh, which I think is a kind of self serving misnomer. I call them radical academic skeptics. And uh, they uh, really make a major contribution, in my opinion. I think they're the unsung heroes of the, all the three schools. I like them the most. And the reason I do is because they're to the bone, principled sophists. And what I mean by that is they make strong arguments weak and weak arguments strong. And as a result, they take on every conventional opinion in Washington and show that it's nonsense. As a result, it's very useful. Some of it strikes me as absolutely profound and probably maybe correct. They have a dim view of how immediate nuclear terrorism is, for example. And they marshal all these arguments, and it's kind of useful to read. Uh, they also say, uh, they poo poo deterrence as an explanation for you know, why we ended the Second World War, why we won the Cold War. And I think as counterfactuals, they are very stimulating for, for students. I would encourage anyone teaching to use John Mueller's work. I do. I think it's very helpful. Also, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they marshal lots of information. They have footnotes. These people read a lot. My kind of people. However, to go a little overboard. The transition from zero to one is something they don't pay a whole lot of attention to. Uh, you could get bombed by an Israeli or an American or an Iranian. Uh, you know, even the Indians and, uh, and the Russians thought about bombing Pakistan or uh, China. Uh, it's risky business. They don't talk enough about that. Also, they don't talk about transition from one to enough, whatever enough means, or more. Yeah. I think that transition is something anyone studying you know, peace kinds of things, and war kinds of things, should pay more attention to. Also, you know, to say proliferation is good or it doesn't matter at all, I mean, it's got to sound a little good, but I mean, most practical people would not ever buy into that, at least not yet. Maybe with enough schooling, you know, we'll have a generation of officials. They'll say, well, it's a mess, but it doesn't matter. You know, we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, I think uh, for that reason, uh, also, you see certain practical arguments that are made. Uh, my favorite is that uh, non-proliferation is uh, a bad idea because it causes wars. By the way, this is a view that the Iraq war was primarily driven by a desire to promote non-proliferation. Having been in the Pentagon in an office that was responsible for that, let me give you my view. That's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk privately. I may not convince you, but I think that's nuts. Um, the other thing uh, they say is nonproliferation is preventing us from, from uh, benefiting from 
the spread of uh, money-making, cross-priority-driving nuclear power. Somebody doesn't know how to add. That doesn't make any sense. That's nonsense. By the way, I talked with John Mueller about this. I said, you know, we ought to work together. You need a good editor, because he makes all these arguments. I said, you'd have a great book, even greater if we work together. <laughs> we become friendly. In any case, uh, now I have to close this thing out. In Washington, the question, well, let's see, uh, let's, let's stage this. In, in, in New York, uh, the question is roughly, how much do you make? Do you have money? Are you going to get money? In California, I can say this because I'm a native. What are you into? Maybe. Or how do you feel? <laughs> In Washington, the question is, where are you now? By the way, you know what that's code for? Why should I talk to you? How are you going to get me my next job? <laughs> it's really that bad. Okay. By the way, why I come to the West Coast as often as I can. Um, it's just healthier. Even New York is healthier in some respects. So I have to answer the question, well, where am I? I think the common sense of, of all of this is not that difficult to tackle. Fewer is better, and fewer hands is better. Transitions, however, are important. How you get down is non-trivial. You want not to be alone. You don't want not to know what the others are doing. That's tricky business. But it's worth dedicating yourself to it. I don't think that should be in dispute. Common sense, you'd think. Believe it or not, I haven't seen anybody say that. I mean, it's just amazing. Anyway, so I wrote it out. Now, in specific, couple of recommendations in the back of the book, and then I'll close it out. Uh, we focus an awful lot of our arms control nonproliferation effort on Europe and European problems, very historically sound. I think the center of gravity financially, militarily, politically is moving towards Asia. And so, sh so too should our focus on arms control and proliferation. We need to focus on Asia, and I think China in specific. It's long overdue. I've argued this for some time. In that regard, it would be very useful to focus on two functionalities. By the way, this isn't to the exclusion of the rest of the world. Uh, missiles. By the way, when you talk to people of Chinese, they say, oh, you first. You have more. You first. And then the Russians. Yeah? There we got a point. I always say, okay, let's talk about missiles. You have the most, you first. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what to say. With it. So yours have a longer range. Okay, we'll do the short range ones. <laughs> then they're really stuck, because they got a lot of them. And they're getting better. They're getting better and better and better. Now, not only are they uh, able to carry nuclear warheads, but they can do nuclear missions uh, without uh, with proper cluster and smart munitions, they can do with two of these things what used to only be able to be done with two tactical nuclear missiles. I think that's got to be of some interest to everybody. And if we're not paying attention to that, that's weird. By the way, uh, Reagan, uh, besides saying, you know, we shouldn't fight nuclear war, also said we should eliminate what he called nuclear missiles. Now, I'm not sure even he knew exactly what that meant. But roughly, the expression or manifestation of that desire was the INF Treaty, which eliminated a class of ground-based nuclear-capable missiles. And I think he thought they mattered the most from looking at notes, and I have looked at notes, because those are the ones you use for first strike, he thought. I kind of like that. It fits with arms control uh, instruction as well. You, you don't have to be a Reagan supporter to think that. You can be, you know kind of into arms control and things like that. It's a certain appeal. Uh, I think the other thing we really need to get on with is fizzle controls. And I don't mean uh, military fizzle. I mean fizzle that can be made into bombs, whether it's in the military stockpile or not. I've been spending the last three years, I suspect, along with everybody else who's gotten money from the Carthage in East Asia. But it is a problem. 
it's getting worse. And the silence of our government on these topics is appalling. By the way, this is not a partisan comment. I don't think it would change it would change the team. We don't want to offend our friends, that's South Korea and Japan. And as a result, uh, we're not saying enough what they shouldn't get into. And with regard to the Chinese, we're, we're so enthusiastic with Japan and Korea and China about promoting nuclear power, we think you can't be against breeders who are reprocessing them. So we want to talk about the fuel cycles of the future, I quote the president, in Asia. What does that mean? It's closing the fuel cycle. It's recycling, which means breeders, fast reactors. We are actively promoting this in all three of these countries. I would roughly say that's not helpful. Uh, physical controls, making the cooperation of civil nuclear energy more uh, tougher with regard to standards on enrichment and reprocessing, very sensible. Uh, two last things. Um, you need to start thinking not about verifying or enforcing non-proliferation. By then it's too late. I mean, I, mean, if, I don't know what your position is on the Iran deal, but let's just all agree about one thing. It's not pretty. I mean, that much we can admit. I mean, you wouldn't want to be doing that a lot. You could avoid it. Um, similarly, you know, bombing things strikes me is not a great way to go. It's not my first choice, I'll tell you that. It seems to me if you act earlier, on uh, first indications before you clearly verify, you don't have to do anything dramatic or deadly. I know I've had an opportunity in government to work with others to actually have some successes uh, where we really didn't have to do a whole lot, but we acted early. Um, I think finally, there's a, a kind of trivialization and denegation, uh, degradation, degradation, what's the word? Denigration. 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 Okay. Denigration. That's why I'm married. Um, <laughs> we downplay and badmouth international law. And part of it, I think, is it became very much in vogue to interpret international law, I think after the war, in a way which restrained us a lot more than some of the folks we have to compete with. And so hard-headed people just dismiss it entirely now. Uh, I would appeal to everyone to, when they come to Washington, go to the National Defense University, that there is a building uh, that's dedicated to the War College, and it, it's named after Secretary of War Root. He uh, was not only Secretary of War, he was the founder of the American Association for International Law. And as he explained it, he said, you know, if you can convince people of what's fair, uh, more often than not, it's going to serve your interests. <laughs> Beats bombing people. Having a kind of hard-headed international law approach strikes me as something we need to get back to. With that, I'll, I'll conclude. And